The year is 1915. The place, Echo. It's time to enter the smoke room for the first time. Yes, this is the prequel to Echo for what for a long time we refer to as 1915, if we had no better name for it. And I'm just going to do a quick intro here, so don't worry, we'll get there. But while I'm doing that, you can just admire Cardman's great work on this CG here. I love the way we're starting this. And look at that logo. Very reminiscent of Echo, which I know is deliberate, and that's a great choice to do that. It doesn't say too much about Echo, but it just it's there. Nice job. And that music. Of course, I'm going to talk all over the music. Another the reason you should download this and play it, you can hear the music properly. As you got it, I've played this already, and I really do like it. So we'll get straight into it, and uh, just before we do... I don't know whether you decided on this effect coming up, Howley or George or whoever it was. Nice job. I really like the way this opens. So let's get into it. The smoke room. Tired. I'm tired of scraping by every day. I'm tired of hiding in the back of this whorehouse. I'm tired of the other broken, crumbling buildings around me. I'm tired of the work I do. I'm tired of this town. I'm just tired. No matter what I do, no matter how, how hard I try to change things, it just feels like I'm moving in circles here. An endless circle. <laughs> That's what this shithole of a town is. I'm getting out tonight. I glare out to the setting sun, wondering what possessed me to settle in this desert. Even with my undershirt off, I'm pouring sweat under my fur, and I can feel it trickling down between my shoulder blades. Thank God it's Sunday, otherwise I'd just have to hope my first customer likes that sort of thing. I've had a few, actually. I stand there for a while longer, finally deciding that the sun set enough for me to start getting ready. I move from the balcony to the hallway, then to my room. I move around quietly. For some reason, the idea of what I'm about to do makes me feel like i got to keep it all secret. Sure, they can't just keep me here, but I know they don't want me to leave. I pull on my clothes, buttoning up my shirt and pulling my suspenders over my shoulders. Then I stand quietly next to the door, listening. It's mostly quiet. I can hear the girls laughing and talking a ways away, probably down in the empty saloon. Good. Quietly I might make my way to the corner of my room, just behind the bed. Kneeling down, I work my claws between the floorboards, knowing exactly which one I want because I've memorised the pattern of the wood grain. I pull it up while pulling a face at the squeaky, groaning noise it makes. A loud shrieking sound from below makes me jump and freeze, listening. I realise it's just one of the girls, laughing, <laughs> probably drunk. Holding my breath, I stick my free paw down through the small space I made between the floorboards and feel around. I keep holding my breath until I feel the three flat pieces of cold metal stacked on top of each other. Using my claws again, I pick them up, careful not to drop them because I've already done that and the sound they make would bring everyone from running. Slowly, I lower the floorboard again. Feeling it all less ten steps since I think they're drunk enough down there they won't even remember I'm up here. I kneel there on the floor, looking at the one gold eagle and the two double eagles resting on my palm pad. It's odd thinking that these three coins represent everything I've been working for for the past two years. Fifty dollars, and if Jack really knows what he's doing, it's enough to get me the hell out of here. The door slams open, I jump a foot in the air, even though I'm on my knees. Jesus! I manage to close my paw in time so the coins don't go rolling across the floor, clutching them to my chest as I freeze on the spot. Sammy, enough hiding away up here. Come downstairs. What are you doing? I still haven't looked back, holding both paws on my chest as I try to get my breathing into control. Uh, I'm praying. I look back and see Cynthia giving me a look like she doesn't believe me at all. You pray? Of course I pray. 
Well, I mean, the down on your knees and clasp your paws to heaven kind of praying. I sigh, trying to sound annoyed even though I'm just scared she's going to see what I'm doing. I put one foot on the ground under me, and as I come up and turn to face the fox, I slide the coins as smooth as I can into my right pocket. Cynthia frowns as I turn to face her. You're right, Sam. You look a little shaken up. Thank God the girls somehow didn't notice, and I finally feel my heart start to calm down a little bit. I fold my arms, glaring. Well, that's because you busted in here without even a knock. Sorry about that, just kind of forgot to. I mean, the other girls don't really do it. I think the real main reason that she's a bit canned from drinking down in the saloon with the others. I remember next time. Anyway, come on down, we're all having such a good time. I sigh and shake my head. Not tonight. Cynthia sighs. Oh, stop being so down all the time. Besides, we're uh, talking about you. That perks my ears up. Why? Well, you know there's this weasel in town. He's from Batavia and apparently he's made an appointment here. The fox bounces up and down excitedly, paws up to a muzzle. So what? Oh, Sam, he's from Batavia first of all and he made the appointment with you. I bristle. How do you know that? Well, I didn't look at the list. I would never. But Gabriel did. The fox grins again. I push my paws to my face, sign in frustration. You know how much trouble you get into for that? You'd lose me in my whole business if you got up that you guys are snooping on my clients. Not that it matters anymore. Again, it wasn't me that did it, and it was a one-time thing to see who was getting the weasel. We didn't expect it to be you. Doesn't make it right. No, it doesn't. Now come downstairs. I sigh. No, I'm heading out for the night. This room's too stuffy. I think the evening air will do me some good. Cynthia gives me a look. Well, I've seen more than I can count. Fine, but you should try to show your face around more often. That's the first step to building your clientele. She tells me this like I haven't heard it a thousand times before. But again, it doesn't really matter now. You know mine are different. They find me. I can tell I'm wearing the fox out. In her buzz state, she gives up on me quicker than usual. Well, I'm going back downstairs. You're always welcome to join us. Believe it or not, most of us like you. Yeah, yeah. As she's about to turn the corner, I suddenly remember this might be the last time I ever see her. And thanks. I blurted it out awkwardly, not used to saying it. And Cynthia's not used to hearing it based on how she leans back around the doorframe, a confused look on her face. Yeah, don't worry about it. You're right, Sam. I curse myself for sounding so damn suspicious, but I keep a straight face, shrugging. Like I said, it's stuffy in here. Makes me feel like I'm going crazy. But thanks for making an effort. Sure, Sam. Stay safe on those streets. I will. Cynthia disappears behind the door frame, and I realise that I'm sad to see her go. She's one of the few people I'm going to miss here, aside from a few of my clients. I shoved a few bits of clothes and belongings I have into an old knapsack I found on the side of the road a few months ago. I take a last look around my room, glad for once that I don't own much. It'll make what I'm about to do a hell of a lot easier. With that, I carefully make my way down the stairs, listening to my chattering co-workers as I turn the corner and take the back exit through the empty kitchen. It's that time of night that the typical crowds of the day switch out for the typical crowds of the night. Men talk and shout in little cluster groups in front of the saloons that don't bother with the Sunday law. The street walkers stand in alleys and doorways, waiting for any of the drunk men wandering the streets to notice them. The lowest of the low, and even if I manage to find a spot in the most reputable brothel in town, I still feel like I'm one of them. I walk quickly through the streets, head down, pause in my pockets, the way I always walk. It usually keeps attention away, even with my attention grabbing white fur. I look up a few times, trying to make sure I'm heading in the right direction. I'm not used to this part of town. Jack had wanted me to meet him near the mine since he apparently needs me to help him with something before we hop the midnight train. A fetal thrill in my chest at the idea that by sunrise Echo will be far behind me. On my way to a life on the west coast where I can start over the right way. I actually have to stop myself from skipping, excited for the first time since I started planning all this. I still feel guilty leaving everyone behind. Madame Dora for giving me a place to stay and work. William and Nick for just listening to me. Cynthia for being a friend. 
everyone gets their chance to get out of this town someday. And this is my chance. If you miss that chance, then you miss it. Then you're stuck. At least that's what I've been told about this place. True or not, I'm not going to miss mine. The buildings become fewer as I get closer to the mine, the dirt road becoming harder to discern from the sagebrush-covered wilderness. I feel better, though, being away from all the light and the people. It makes me feel protected somehow. There's a small light ahead of me. I know right away that it's Jack with his lantern, right where he said he'd be. Relief floods through me, having had suspicions that I'd been duped somehow up until this point. I'd only known the man for a week. He'd approached me the idea of pooling our fortunes and making a break for the coast. So seeing him now with his gas lamp held up, a grin on his face. It's really going to happen. His expression is infectious, so I smile back sheepishly, raising a paw. Jack? Howdy, Sam. How are you this fine evening? Better now that I'm out of that pit. The older man claps me on the back hard, and even though he's a good deal smaller and less muscular than I am, it almost makes me stumble. And you'll never have to go back again. How does that feel? I take a deep breath. Good, I think. I don't really know yet. That's normal. I've done it a few times myself. Hopefully this will be the last time now that I've got myself a partner. The paw on my back moves to wrap around my side, pulling me into a side hug. I feel my spirits lifting a bit. If this man is always this friendly, then maybe our little partnership will work out after all. Even though he's been my customer only twice over the past week, he talked to me about things more personal than any of my clients have, including William. He was understanding, witty, and on top of that, good at what we do before all the talking. He even taught me a few tricks to help keep my other customers coming back. So you got all your stuff? Yep. I turned and showed him the beaten up knapsack on my back. Ha! Not carrying much, are you? Ah, no worries. We'll build a life here soon enough. And the money? I pause, almost panicking as I've got for just a second where I put the coins. Then I shove a paw into my pocket and pull them out. Jack raises the lamp, examining the eagle and two double eagles resting in my paw. He whistles. Been a while since I've seen a double, no less two. Ah, good work, boy. He slaps me again and I have to close my fingers quickly to avoid dropping them. I push them back into my pocket, prodding my fingers around just to make sure there aren't any holes in that I don't know about. At the same time I look up at the sky, guessing it's probably about nine in the evening. That gives us a few hours before the train comes through, though I want to be there as soon as possible so we don't miss it. Despite the relief I just felt, the thought of hopping a train soon has me getting nervous all over again. Last time I did it I almost slipped under the wheels. So what was it you needed help with? Well... Jack sets his free paw on his hip, grinning at me again. I struck big in the mine. I frown. What? Samuel, I found gold in the mine. I stare at the other man, confused. How? As far as I know, you need stuff, machinery or something to get the gold out. How did Jack have all that to himself? He moves closer. See, this is what I want to tell you about. I didn't dig it up. Someone left some gold in a few bags they'd already done mined. I go on staring, hardly believing what I'm hearing. I know, looks like they've been there a long time. It's in a part of the mine that no one goes to anymore. I think they just forgot about them back in the day. Jack starts walking up the path toward the mine, and I'm left staring after him for a few seconds before I quickly start to follow, trying to find words to say. But, but, how could anyone forget something like that? I see the old man's bony shoulders lift up and down in a shrug. Who the hell knows? Listen, there's a bag of the stuff. I think it's enough to... Well, let's live rich for the rest of our lives. Like, real rich. I'm silent, stunned. I can't believe what I just heard. How could anyone... Jack just told me he found something that could change my life completely. Not just move the coast, but move there and live rich. It's something I never even considered. I'm quiet until Jack takes a left turn, off of the path into the brush even though the entrance to the mine is a hundred feet straight ahead of us. I stand on the path for a few seconds, looking back and forth between him and the mine. Jack? Come on boy, we don't got much time. I hesitate, then force myself forward, cursing as I start stepping on the sharp stones hidden beneath the sagebrush. Where are you going? You see... Jack starts moving up the side of the big hill that the mine entrance is attached to, the slanted ground adding to the treachery walking blindly through the wilderness. 
I still mind it's in the main stretch of the mine, even though it's Sunday. That's why I left it there until now. We're going to grab it and get the hell out of town before anyone can get their dirty paws on it. Oh. I have to tuck my tail for as it gets caught between twigs and the bush, making me grimace. Is it far? It's right here. Jack turns to face a slight outcrop of boulders in the side of the hill, almost hidden by the brush that's growing around it. He sets a lamp down at the base of the boulders, then starts jumping up to try and climb up one of them. Here. I easily pull myself up the side of the boulder, and Jack chuckles as he lifts the lamp up toward me. I'm getting too old to do anything these days. No, I know that's not true. I set the lantern down next to me before reaching back down to lift Jack up by his paw. He pants me on the back end for grabbing the lantern and turning around. Behind the boulders, it'll drop that leads into what looks like a small fissure in the side of the hill. What is this? Jack grins in the light of the lantern. Secret little back entrance. How the hell did you find it? Jack had only been working in the mines for a few weeks. He'd have been able to figure all of this out. A few of the others know. Just had to talk to him. Jack leaves the lantern on the ledge of the boulder before sliding down a little space, turning around and reaching up again for me to lower it down to him. I slide down after him and immediately feel a gust of cool, musty air coming from inside the opening. It feels damn good compared to the heat outside. When I look down the little tunnel ahead of us, though, I start to feel a little more unsure of what's happening here. Jack just goes on ahead, though, confident as he always is. So I follow him. Watch your head, Sam. You're big enough to get a knock from up there. I do as he says, glancing up and ducking under dips in the ceiling that come down every now and then. We come to a branch in our tunnel and Jack immediately goes left. Then we go right, then right again, then... Hey, you know where we are? We could get lost. I know exactly where we are. Don't worry your pretty little kitty head about that. He's still got that cheerful sound in his voice, but it's getting me a little riled up considering the type of situation we're in. Still, he doesn't hesitate to any of the branches in the tunnel, so I have to assume he knows what he's doing. He works here after all. The tunnels are a lot narrower than I always imagined them to be. I wonder if it's just the way this specific part of the mine is. Nick definitely wouldn't be able to fit through some of these passages. Jack comes to an abrupt stop that I'd almost run into him. He's standing in front of a little opening in the wall, even smaller than the one we came in through. He breathlessly holds up the lantern to it, almost like it's holy or something. Here it is, Sam. Here it is. His excitement is getting to me, getting me going a bit too, but I eye the dark opening with a frown. <sighs> Don't think I'm going to fit through there. It's the same size the whole way through. You'll make it, but you have to turn those big old shoulders sideways. He reaches up and pats my chest appreciatively before walking through the opening, able to do so without turning sideways. I shimmy through the opening, careful not to scrape myself on any of the jutting bits in the walls. This tunnel is a lot shorter, thank God, but the air becomes thick, a lot mustier, and now I completely believe, Jack, that this is some abandoned part of the mine, probably from when they first started it up. The lantern gaslight disappears for a moment as I realise that Jack has made it through to the other side, and that's when I break through, finally able to breathe easy in the wider space we come into. Looking around, though, it's just a tiny little hollow, smaller than the size of my room. There are a few things laying around, though, a shovel and a pickaxe against the wall, what looks like a tin cup in the corner, and finally a few bags at the far end of the hollow, looking full and lopsided. I notice that Jack's breathing heavy, and considering how we weren't really exerting ourselves at all, I can only imagine it's from excitement. Yeah. Jack points to the bags, and I can see that even his paw is shaking. I swallow hard and start moving toward the bags. Really? They're all filled up? They're the size of my head, and it seems impossible that all of that could be gold. Yes, look in them. I let out a short little laugh that just comes out of me, because I still can't believe any of this. At least not until I see it. So, I crouch down in front of one of the bags, grabbing the drooping opening which I lift up and spread open to peer inside. Rocks. I squint at them, wondering if maybe the gold is stuck inside of them or something. That would explain the ridiculous amount, but I don't see anything glinting. I start to ask Jack to bring the lantern closer. Hey, can you... An explosion goes off in my head. It shakes my entire body, my entire world. Everything stops and I can't think. 
Actually, I am conscious of one thing. At least my teeth clacking together like someone just punched me in the chin. But it's not coming from the front of my head. It's the back. Then the world comes back to me. I realize I'm still crouching over the bag somehow. But my shoulders are all bunched up. My head leaned back like the muscles in my neck are cramping. I gasp really loud like I'm drowning. And I slowly bring my paws up to where that explosion happened. They go automatically to the back of my head, between where my neck and skull meet. I just sit there for a second, confused as all hell, wondering if something fell from the ceiling as I go on staring at the bag. Yeah, big son of a bitch! <coughs> then another explosion, a little higher so it hits my head and my paws. This time I feel my body go all stiff in the strangest way, my legs straightening out which pushes me away from the bag and onto my back, and I see my arms sticking up, paws reaching toward the ceiling. Goddamn brick shit house. I blink at the sky above me in confusion, wondering why it's so yellow and dirty. I keep blinking at it, waiting for it to go back to blue or black with stars, whatever time it is. I can use someone next to me moving around, then I feel something on my hip, someone tugging at my pants. Now where'd you put him? He's mumbling over me and I recognise the voice as Jack's. What is Jack doing? Mine. I reach down to cover up my pocket, trying to ask him what the hell he's doing. But all that comes out of this garbled moaning doesn't sound like me at all. No, no, pause down or I'll hit you again. It takes a second, but I manage to focus on the smaller man leaning over me, one paw fishing around in my pocket while the other holds a shovel. I start to ask again what he's doing. Then his paw yanks out of mine. He lets out a little laugh that's so loud and high-pitched it makes me flinch. <laughs> there they are. I can't see what he's holding, but I hear the clink of coins, and everything comes back to me in the water full of confusion, hurt, and most of all, anger. I lunge up and grab at his arm, coming up far too short as a wave of sickening pain shoots through my head and down my back. He dodges me easily. Down, pussycat! I don't wanna, but I'll give you another one if you don't just stay laying on the ground. The man moves away towards his lantern while I stay sat down, putting a paw to the back of my head with a moan. Shadow blocks out the light, and I realise exactly what Jack is doing. He's going to try and leave me here, lost in the mines while he takes off with my money, everything that I have. A snarl works its way to my throat, and almost without me even thinking about it, I'm pouncing after him, just as he's about to pick up his lantern. My paws smash into his back right between his shoulder blades. Like he kept mentioning, I'm a hell of a lot bigger than him, and he goes down like a broken matchstick, belly flopping into the dirt. <laughs> I hear him lose his breath, and before he can do anything else, I slam my fist into the side of his face as hard as I can, four or five times. He hollers after the first, but goes quiet after the third, seizing up under me. I sit there on top of him, gasping for breath, still wondering what the hell just happened. So I stare down at Jack at his fluttering eyelids and the blood coming out of his mouth, and realise how stupid I am. So God, I'm stupid. Most people probably would have seen this coming a mile away, but I thought I knew Jack. Well, at least as much you can know a person in a week. The thought of so much gold, of living rich. I've been completely blinded by the thought of it. Jack starts to groan louder and move around more, so I reach over his right paw, forcing it open and grabbing my coins. I clutch them protectively to my chest as I stand up, feeling a sudden wave of dizziness as I do. I stumble toward the opening and then rest against it for a moment, catching my breath, waiting for my blurry eyes to focus. The sharp pain in my head is gone now, replaced by a deep throb that penetrates all the way from the back of my neck to the back of my eyes. I reach up to rub it again and my paw comes away wet and bloody. I start to worry there might be more hurt than I thought. I need to get help, have someone look at it, but first I need to find my way out of this damn mine. I start to push my way through the opening again, but then I remember that I need a lamp. I turn around and find Jack already up, moving toward me, just five feet away, this time the pickaxe in his paws. Dully, I wonder if it's a throbbing, rushing sound in my ears that had kept me from hearing him, but I don't have time to think anything else he rushes at me, thrusting the head of the pick at my face. He doesn't say anything this time, just screams. I flinch and raise my paws, but I also let my feet go out from under me, and that's what saves me as I land hard on my rear, and I hear the metal hit the hard wall of the cave behind me. 
The drop sends a wave of pain through my head that's so bad I gag and almost throw up. But then I see Jack raising the pick above his head, ready to bring it down on me. He's going to kill me. Even after what's happened, I find it almost impossible to believe. But there it is in front of me. The man I thought was my friend, silhouetted by the lamp's dim light, the muscles under his fur bunching up, a snarl of fury on his face. I scream, raising my paws to protect myself. Coins fall into the ground as all have been run through with the pick sends fear through me like I've never known. Don't! Don't! As he's raising it, it knocks against the ceiling of the hollow, and Jack starts adjusting the angle of the pick. I know this is my only chance, and I push myself up off the ground at him, running into him while I grab at his weapon. He panics and swings too late, the wooden handle landing weakly against my forearm as I reach up and grab it. We both snarl and growl as I pin him to the wall, keeping his weapon above his head with both paws, trying to lift it from his grasp. He's got a good hold on it, though, at least until he takes his right paw away to try and punch at my side. I'm so tense from anger and fear that I don't feel anything, and with one of his paws gone I'm able to yank it from him. I stumble back as he drops down. He looks up at me. Our eyes meet. I bring the head of the pickup and smash him right in the forehead as hard as I can. The sound is deep and sickening like ice cracking on a frozen river. When I pull the pickaxe away his expression is completely different. His eye is empty and distant. He leans there a moment. Then his body suddenly spasms and goes ramrod straight before sliding sideways down the wall to lay on his back. I see his paws twitch into fists, pulling up to his chest before he gives this big, heavy sigh. Then he stops breathing altogether. I stare down at him, my chest heaving, the pick hanging loosely in my paw as I wait. Jack? He doesn't move, not at all. Just from the looks of him, I can tell that he's dead. I keep staring, my mind still trying to figure out how I got here from just ten minutes ago. But no matter how much I stare, nothing changes in front of me. Jack is dead on the ground. I feel a chill run up my spine, as this feeling of dread that seems to start pulling up from the earth into my legs and up into my stomach. I don't know why, but I feel like I'm being watched. Like... I just woke something up and it's watching me now. I drop the pick and back away from Jack, my nerve failing me, unable to crouch down to Jack if he really is dead. Despite everything I've been through, I've never seen anyone dead before. Shakily, I turn away from him, looking around. I need to get my money and get the hell out. If I get caught like this, the men here won't need much more of a reason to hang a whore like me. I reach out for the lamp that's been sitting on the ground peacefully this whole time. I'm still unsteady, still shaky, so when I try to lift up the wire handle I knock the whole thing over. Instantly the flame goes out. I stare in shock at the sudden complete blackness before fumbling for the lantern, as if lifting it up is going to light it again. Instead I just touch the heated glass, making me hiss as I burn the pads of my index and middle finger. The shape of the now dead flame burned into my vision is the only thing I can see now. No, 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 no. I whisper into the blackness, suddenly realising how deep I am into all of this. I don't know the way out to begin with, and now with no light. I try to keep calm, swallowing hard. I know straight ahead of me is the opening that leads back into the mine. Jack has said something about others knowing about this place. Maybe I could run into someone or just find my way out. We didn't walk that long, did we? I walk carefully forward, paws reaching out until I find the wall. From there, I pour around until I find the small opening that leads out into the main tunnels. Now when I drop the coins here, I go down on my knees and start to feel around for them. Please, please let me find them. I whisper to myself, to God, to nothing, begging my paws to feel the cool metal. I can't have been searching for the minute when something suddenly glides up my spine, like a finger being drawn up my back. Then breath in my ear. I let an involuntary scream turning over on my back and scrambling backwards until I come up against the wall, a rod of pain sticking through my brains as I do. J Jack? I stare wide-eyed in the darkness at the spot where I left him, listening, my heart about to pound out of my chest. I've never been more scared in my entire life. 
Something shifts in the hollow with me, further to the right from where I'm staring. I flinch, ears flat against my head. Jack? I call out again, actually hoping that the man is still alive. This isn't something else, whatever that might be. Because it feels like something else. A few moments of silence go by, so I start to turn over. And that's when I feel something lean over my shoulder. I shriek in a way that I never have before, scratch at the wall in front of me, desperately trying to find the opening. When I do, I force myself through, my shoulders scraping painfully against the walls. I don't understand. I don't understand. Something's coming after me through the tiny crevice, and it's not Jack. It's definitely not Jack. I burst through to the other side, my face meeting the hard dirt wall of the larger tunnel, my head snapping back and leaving my nose stinging. I stumble to my right in the direction I know we came from. I've never had trouble seeing in the dark, but this is complete inky blackness, and there's nothing for me to be able to see. Help! Someone help me! I don't care that I might get caught anymore. I just need to get out of here. My paws swing around wildly, feeling the walls, feeling ahead of me. I can't hear the thing behind me anymore, but that doesn't matter. I just killed a man, and something I can't explain happened right after, and I just can't understand. I run into another wall hard and randomly pick the next direction, heading to the right again, still feeling around blindly with my torn at paws. Finally, my wits catch up with me, and I force myself to slow down, to stop making so much damn noise that I can listen. It's quiet. Whatever it was that was following me isn't anymore, or it's just too far away. But as I'm listening, I do hear something far back the way I came. A stuttered, rhythmic sound, deep and scratchy. I don't know what it is. It grows in volume. I press myself back against the wall, pause up to my muzzle to keep from breathing too hard. It's far away, but it's getting so much louder it's echoing up the tunnel. Then silence. I realise then I'm crying, and I try to keep quiet, the sobs hitching in my chest. I can't remember the last time I cried. I'm frozen. I know that isn't Jack. Jack is dead, and something else was in that hollow with me. I just turn away from where the noise came from and start moving again. I'm walking this time, and even though the tears keep running down my face, I'm at least quiet. The complete, overwhelming fear has settled into a dull, almost numb feeling in my chest. I aimlessly walk left and right each time I feel a new passage open up with my paws. While the sounds go away, the feeling that something is watching me never does. I think I wander for a few hours, maybe more. It's hard to keep track of time when everything's black. I must have gone all night, because what saves me is the sight of light pouring through the end of a long tunnel. The one we came through. I move toward it on instinct, not even really feeling all that excited to see it. I'm relieved, but it's numbed, just like the fear. I carefully scramble up the boulders and out into the early morning, the sun just barely rising. All the better I'm getting out before the town really starts to wake up. I slide over the boulders to the ground, my button-up and undershirt riding up as I do, and I feel the rough rock scratch through my fur to my stomach and chest. I lean there a moment, feeling the corners of my muzzle dip down as my body starts to try and cry again. I stop myself. I don't cry anymore and I can't cry now. People might see, they might suspect something. So with a deep breath I turn around and start walking along the incline of the hill toward the road to the main entrance of the mine. Once I get there I start making my way back to the saloon, my feet kicking up dust as I can barely pick them up at this point. Ahead of me I see someone walking up the road, a big guy, it's only then that my stupid head realises that being seen right now would be very, very bad. He's already seen me and I recognise him at the same time he recognises me. He actually stops in his tracks just to stare at me. I stop too, unsure of what he's about to do. Then he jogs the rest of the way, surprise on his face. Samuel, what are you doing? Then I see his eyes really widen up as he gets a good look at me. What happened? I... I'm still numb, even though I realise this is real bad, having Nick see me like this after what I just did. Fell down. Fell down. Nick repeats the words, as if he show me just how stupid they sound. I look down on my shirt and see that it's covered in drops of dried blood. 
Every chip and brush to back my paw against my nose, and the white fur comes back with crusted flakes and more blood. I hear Nick gasp as I'm looking down. He grabs me by the shoulder and turns me sideways. Dear God! What? Your head is busted all open! I reach back and all I feel is crusted up fur. Nick pushes my paw away. No, no, you need to see a doctor. I don't have money for a doctor. Then I will help you see one. You don't got money either. I know others with money. Who beat you? I take a deep breath, staring down at the ground, knowing that I need to get back to the saloon before someone else sees me. Just some asshole on the street. I don't know who. Did he beat you because of your work? What did he look like? The badge's grip on my shoulder tightens. It's not often I see him angry. Still, I gotta get back. I pull away from his paw, moving up the road. I, I need to go wash up. I can tell you more later. Samuel. Sorry, but I gotta go. Just come see me in the saloon sometime. Nick stays silent as he watches me walk off. It's right then I remember I still got my knapsack on. Something I had noticed all that time in the cave. I can only imagine it makes me look even more suspicious. I decide to stay behind the buildings on my way back. It does a good job of hiding me from almost everyone who's up this early. I reach the saloon, walking up to the back entrance. I stand at the door for about a minute, listening, but it's completely silent. Hopefully the girls turned in after the night of drinking. I open the door quietly, glad to see the place completely empty. On my way through the kitchen, I grab the smallest bottle of old rye whiskey that I can find. Just hoping it won't be missed, and if it is, it'll be blamed on someone else. As I move up the stairs quietly as I can, I do hear some low murmuring coming from one of the girls' rooms, but I'm quiet enough on my feet that I'm sure they don't hear me. I finally get to my own room and open the door, wincing as it makes the usual creaking sound it always does, hoping to God that Cynthia isn't up to hear it. I stand in my room for a while, just staring. Wondering how I got myself into this mess, at the same time realising it's all my own damn fault. Finally managed to make my way to the dresser, looking at myself in the mirror. About as bad as I thought. White fur must have everywhere, stained pinkish red down my nose and chin, my right eye swelled up a bit. I can't see the back of my head, when I turn it this way and that I can tell from a few glances that it's a disaster back there. I strip down and go about cleaning myself up, using my cup and drinking water barrel to pour water on my already bloody shirt, which I use to wipe up my fur. When I get to the back of my head, I can feel the skin moving around in ways that I'm not used to. I wonder if Nick was right that I should see a doctor and get stitched up. Maybe, after I've slept. For now, I settle roping in the whiskey bottle and taking several swigs, while pouring on my shirt and pressing that to the back of my head. My vision flashes wide and I suck air hard through my teeth, screwing up my face as I try not to scream. I do it a few more times and I just can't stand the pain anymore, dropping the shirt to the side of the dresser and finally stumbling into my bed, carefully laying face first on my pillow. The warmth of the alcohol in my stomach dulls the aches in my body, and gratefully I'm able to fall asleep. I'm back in the hollow, lying flat on my back staring into the dark. My face feels strange on my forehead and eyes, like it's caved in. I know I'm not alone, so I can hear the whispers and slithering sounds in the mine. Something's been woken up, and it's restless. I feel something grab me, long, slender paws, fingers that grip into my clothes and roll me over. It crawls up my legs, sliding over my rear and back where it sits and chatters to itself. Then, I feel it lean over and lock its teeth into the back of my head. It bites hard, crushing my skull and piercing my brain. Pain explodes in my head as I hear a high-pitched scream. Samuel! I jolt jolt awake in my bed, pulling my face away from the pillow, damp with my own saliva and streaked here and there with dark red blood. Oh my God, he's alive! I hear movement behind me and look back to see Cynthia standing there, both paws to her mouth, the other girl showing up behind her to stare into my room. Sam, what happened? My head hurts way more than it did when I went to sleep. I find myself just staring at them in confusion. Vaguely embarrassed, I'm naked in front of all these females. Then I dry heave and alcohol and bile comes up to splatter on my pillow onto the hardwood floor. This earns a few more screams the girls, grow much taller, all the dough pushes through them. 
Madame Dora stands in the doorway for a moment, taking in the scene for she shoes the girls away. I have just enough time to see Cynthia, her eyes filled with tears before the door shuts on her. Without any hesitation at all, Madame Dora walks over the gently pull me up into a sitting position. The room spins for a minute and I have to shut my eyes tight to keep myself from throwing up again. The deer cuts my face delicately, turning my head just slightly back and forth as she examines it. You to come to me immediately, Sam. I don't know what to say, so I keep quiet. The older woman glances over the dresser, seeing the whiskey bottle there. I wonder if I'm going to get in even more trouble. She just shakes her head. You know, it's also my job to keep you healthy. Whiskey isn't going to fix something like this. Uh, Cynthia! The loud voice makes me flinch. Anything loud is making me flinch, actually. The door immediately cracks open and the fo- fox pokes a muzzle through, making me realise they'll all probably just press the door right now, listening. Hey, yes, madam. Stop that crying and get dressed. Run to Dr Miller's. Tell him to come as soon as he can. Yes, madam. Cynthia disappears again while the madam looks over the rest of my naked body, checking for any of the signs of injury before she looks back up at me. Who did this? I glance down the sheets but she grabs my chin and gently but firmly pulls me back to look at her. My job is also to keep you safe. Be honest with me, I do not care who it is. Her soft brown eyes look right into mine and I swallow. I, I was just having a walk through the streets. A couple of men came up behind me and bashed my head. <laughs> I didn't see them. Madame Dora looks at me for a while longer and I think she probably doesn't believe me. She lets go though and I immediately look back down into my lap deciding to pull the corner of one of the sheets up so I can at least cover myself up a little. You should never go out alone, Sam. You know this. I'm sorry. Well, you've suffered the consequences. Stay in this room until you see the doctor. You won't be working tonight. That should be punishment enough while you rest. Now put some trousers on so I can send one of the girls in to change your sheets. With that, Madame Dora gets up to leave, but not for gently setting a paw to my cheek, giving me a sympathetic smile for making her way out the door, sending the girls against the door scattering. The doctor comes by about an hour later. I spend the afternoon sitting in the chair while he sews at the back of my head. Two deep cuts with a good deal of bruising, according to him. He also mentions it looks like a hit with a heavy tool of some kind. I just sit there quietly, wincing every now and then as he draws the needle and thread through my skin. Meanwhile, looking out the window, business is going on as usual. No shouts of murder, no crowds of people running for the mines. Instead, Echo seems not to have noticed a man named Jack going missing. Still, my stomach twists at the thought of what happened, and I'm still numb both outside and inside. Maybe that little hollow is completely forgotten to the point that no one's been there in years. If that's the case, then I might be able to make it out of this, all right. I'm not all right. I can feel it in my chest. I killed a man in that mine. That's bad enough. But something else happened there, and I don't know what it is. What I do know is it feels like it's clinging to me, still watching me. I close my eyes, listen to the thread pull through my skin, just wishing I'd never met Jack, never trusted him, never went into that horrible mine. I've lost almost everything, and now I just might lose the rest of it. My head still hurts when I wake up. I've been hurting for days and days. Dr Avery said I was lucky when he took out my stitches. No infections. A bone bruise on my scalp at worst. Some heartless idea of luck. If I was lucky I'd be doing something better with my life. Anything better. If I was lucky I would have been born clever. I'd have never met Jack and he wouldn't have done that to me. If I was lucky he wouldn't be dead. And I wouldn't be a murderer. If I was lucky I wouldn't have come to Echo. I still remember how Jack smelled when he mixed with his tobacco. And how he smelled right after he died. I still remember his laugh. How he made me feel unique and special. I thought he was going to set me free. I thought I was going to be happy with him. I'm stupid. I'm so fucking stupid. I always feel something watching me now. It makes me scared and makes me want to cry. It hates me. They'll hate me. They'll hang me for this when they find out. I'm a queer whore without family or friends in the middle of the dirty frontier. God damn it! The sudden patter in the door just makes my head throb worse. Samuel! I peel the thin sheets off my chest, already missing them as the air sucks the warmth from me and I sit up. All I see in front of me is the vanity mirror on top of my dresser. 
I'm looking back at myself, lying in the dark. It seems darker than usual, I'm starting to hate looking into it when I'm alone. If I'll ever really be alone again after that day. There was something down in those mines. Black as tar and sticking to me. If I hadn't met the devil that day, it must have been a close associate of his. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. Peter 5 colon 8 I'd always figured he'd be charming or a deceiver. Tricky, like the good book described him. That's how he traps you, right? He makes you feel loved. He makes you feel unique in all of the world. And then you give everything to him and he takes you and you suffer. That was more like the devil and Jack. What I felt was raw and mean. Some hungry, horrible malice. No tricks. Maybe that's the part the Bible leaves out. All he does after he knows he has you. My soul is damned now, isn't it? Nothing will be the same again for me, will it? I'm so scared. Samuel, may I have a word or a few? Go away, damn it. Come in. She bounces in, then falters. I see her narrow eyes widen, a smile on her muzzle curls into a frown. I didn't mean to hurt you. Stupid of me to be so loud. Oh, it's not so bad. It is. You're crying. Hot streams run down my cheeks as I realise that she's right. I watch for a soft, sorrowful look to twist into curiosity, but it never does. I start to wonder if the reason Cynthia has his job is because she's such, she's such a good actor. How could she not be suspicious of me? How could nobody ask again? Cynthia pulls out a thin roll of parchment from her dress pocket, places it gingerly in my dresser. But Dan wants you to do a few errands today, considering you've been idle. Could be helpful to be out and about for a spell. She smiles shyly as she withdraws her paw from my vanity, too willing to face me when she reaches my doorway. Find me if you need me to do this for you instead, of course, and return before dark. Oh, stop fussing. I won't be caught dead outside after dark. The first time I see Cynthia's features twist into a severe expression. Her voice lowers to a sharp hiss. Well, that's the frightful possibility of the moment, is it not? Follow the route. Do not bother going if you cannot. She closes the door on me without another word. The parchment just reads, Take the day off and mingle with some folks in the saloon. If you plan on going out, follow the safe route where trusted eyes will be on you. Spend some leisure time today. That's not a request. I groan. It's hard to get used to the noise of the main saloon during the day. It's loud and it's crowded. Benton plays in the corner his twangy piano, while the constant murmur of co-workers, family members, or squealing children adds to the ruckus. It's not akin to my simple, sparse room at all. I like the paintings of botanicals hanging from the wood panelling, but I don't much like that they hang from every turn corner. The panel in the bar is buffed, shaved and warped into pretty little curls that resemble the fashionable new style. Ah, uh, Nouve, I think it's called. More important about the bar is that folks generally know not to bother one another there during daylight. So I put myself there. Harlan's brow lifts as he makes his way to me. The severe old hair clicks his tongue to get my attention. What do you have, Sam? He's much busier than he usually is, telling from the sheen of sweat on his brow. He always looks angry to me, but speaks in a flat manner, so I can never tell what's on his mind. The only hint I have on him is left ear flicks when he senses trouble in the lounge. His ear only stopped doing that for me a few months ago. You know, just whiskey with sugar, bitters too. I can do that, Sam. He pulls a clean sipping glass hanging from a rack and starts to busy himself with a few bottles and a jigger. I feel like I'm, if I'm supposed to be making idle chatter, I may as well start with my cohort here. You're holding up well today. The hair grunts and leans in, lowering his voice to a whisper. Ah, oh, big, but ain't this big. I'm running out of stock faster than I should and the girls can barely keep up. We're built for 30 in the lounge at a time, not 40, not 50. And if I turn people away, there's going to be a fuss. He places my drink in front of me, finishing for I noticed. He's fast. Enjoy, Sam. He leaves for I can thank him. Another customer has his attention now, ordering something complicated. I turn around to look at the rest of the bar behind me. The round tables usually reserved for poker are covered in drinks and food, holding patrons. The standing and hanging lamps in this room all have cut glass panels stained pearly white, green or gold. 
so the more expensive ones close to the bar are electric, which Madame says is safer near the alcohol. The oil ones that are close to the cosy tables against the window look welcoming. I avoid sitting near them during the day. What I see there now is a young girl crying over a drink she spilled on a gown. Her ma comforts her while his son drinks beer. There's a crash as he spills his drink too. Benton plays the piano a little louder while some of the waitresses rush out with brooms and rags to help put with a spill and to pick up the glass. I don't envy the waitresses much, would appreciate the opportunity to work day and night shifts here. Madame has me run errands for board. I should be making more. Harden said I was too big to be running in out of the kitchen. It probably isn't wrong, but it's not the answer I wanted. I've been around here for so long that I'm starting to recognise the locals by the day they visit. Huxley, the rat in the corner with dusty sleeves, is always playing a poker on his time here, off here with Reed, the shaggy wolf with a scar on his snout. Now Marcy told me the rug is staying. Does Marcy pay your bills? No. Does Marcy know anything in the world beyond fussing, tidy and playing wooden puzzles all day when you're about to coddle her? No, but the damn rug is her mother's. It's filthy. So I should clean it then. I watch him take turns drawing cards. She tried, but she ain't that clever. I'm just sick of looking at the damn thing. So do something about it then. Royal flush. Son of a bitch. Stop distracting me with your damn stories. Mind your business, you'll win some. The rat smiles and takes his winnings. The wolf slaps another dollar bill on the table. They often get all rowdy. They know not to push it too far. They hear so much as he's almost their home as much as mine. They wouldn't exactly call him family. Wouldn't be surprised they didn't even know who I was. I hear the saloon door flip open in the foyer. A spindly looking weasel dressed in a dapper bow tie turns the corner. His nose twitches as he looks from one customer to another customer rapidly, and the widest, brightest grin I've ever seen spreads across his face. Goodness, here's that old hustle and bustle that I miss. The reputation of Saguaro's hip most certainly precedes her. The stoat sounds foreign. British, maybe, but not quite the same as I've heard before. Some heads turn, and the stoat looks like he's making an announcement to someone or another, but nobody in particular is paying attention or listening. I see Harlan's ear twitch. I'm sorry, sir, but we have no seating left aside from the bar. Well, the bar sounds excellent, my dear. I hope not to impose for very long. You see, I've always wanted to visit an authentic Western saloon. Why wouldn't I want to start there? Cynthia laughs. Politely. She has to struggle to keep her ears from splaying. This is as authentic as it gets, sir. She slowly turns her guide in my way, near the bar. I give her my hardest glare and she tries to communicate. I'm sorry. Not verbally with her eyes and a grimace, where the man is seated. Right next to me. The perfume coming off of him is a bit herbal and strong. Thankfully, the stoat ain't interested in me at the moment. His attention is taken by the bar table itself. He gasps and waves Harlan over with a spastic paw. Sir, is this a genuine Dalbera? I know, sir, it's just Harlan. I couldn't tell you. I just served the drinks here. Well, you have. What's most popular? Beer. The stoat frowns slightly. I try not to make eye contact with him. Ah, I see. Well, I'll have one then. That's more than one kind. Yes, well, then I'd like to have whichever kind is most preferred by the clientele. Harlan nods and gets out a mug. I smell the citrus in my drink and close my eyes to take a sip when I suddenly feel scrutinised. The hairs on the back of my neck rise. I look left, still facing forward, see the stoat stare me down. You're one of the workers here, aren't you? I nearly inhale some my whiskey, and the back of my throat burns. I take my time to stop, to swallow, and then put my glass down. No, just a frequent visitor. That's strange, you fit the exact description of someone I was told to look for. Shit. I look a bit hard and is busy with yet another customer. His ear is still flicking. A mountain line with beautiful markings and near white fur. Built like a house, she said. Work does things to the body. Yeah, yes, it does. I can see the insides of his tiny ears blushing. He'd probably be cute if he didn't talk. That's why I won't be able to tell you very much about the evening selections. Come back after dark if you're interested. Arlen's voice is cold and sharp. I suddenly feel a welling surge of thankfulness from him. Oh, my apologies then. The stoat trembles as his pink paws glide over the buttons of his satchel, playing with them nervously. The ladies will be able to help you with whatever you need. Oh, but I'm interested in the men. My eyes widen. 
I start to sip on my whiskey faster. I don't mind their burns going down. I just need something to keep my mouth covered so I'm not audibly gasping. I'm afraid that we aren't that sort of establishment. Uh, sir, I, I do not. Harlan. I do not mean to be impotent, but I was most specifically informed that you offered male options. Then you should have also known that you have to go through secretive channels to find me, you imbecile. You should stop yelling. I, I hadn't realised that it was. He wasn't. I think we need to have a talk outside, fella. I quietly thank the Lord that readers know about any of my clients now. The bags underneath the middle-aged wolf's eyes are extra puffy today. He always has a stale smell about him. I can tell he's drunk from the way he swaggers. Harlan's ears twitching worse than it's ever been before. Outside sounds like a good idea. There was danger in the hare's tone. The wolf flinched on the sudden snap and he shakes it off. I think I may have made a mistake. Damn yeah, right you did. One of the wolf's friends is staring right at right the stoke from the table. He looks far less drunk but far more upset. It's a frightful look. And when a mistake is made, a remedy can be supplied through, through uh, good communication. I, I, I think talking would be a good idea. Outside. Cliff raises his paws, nodding, puts a loaf of his small satchel over his head. His thin, brown, black-tipped tailor's bottle brush into one unmistakably anxiety spikes. He leaves his beer, untouched, and swiftly escapes from the parlour at the front door. Soon after, the other two follow. Shit. I have to think over my options. Seems like my new foreign friend is getting the authentic experience that he was after. On the one hand, maybe they'll go easy on him and learn some discretion. On the other hand, they might kill him if nobody around to look. I rise from my seat. Let them be, Sam. You don't need any more stitches. I shrug and whisper. You just lost your customer. I don't necessarily want to do the same. I need the money. Harlan places his fist on his chin. Lifts his brow and gives me a curt nod for I turn on him and exit the door. Again, I didn't mean to argue or create a scene. I truly thought my source was reliable. They said the Sanguaro's hip could cater to dandy curiosities. What in the name of God is wrong with this filthy limey? How catching they got on pervert? As if your friend has any room to talk. Cynthia has some filthy stories on him. What kind of shit are you from that produces men like you? Educated men, no less. Harry Kelly says, probably why it's here. The general like him got chased out from where he came from. Why well, be the first faggot to lie? That's a choice of faggot. Call him making eyes at Marcy. The wolf guffaws. Well, oh, don't. She's a nasty bitch. He's a filthy bastard who's not on forgetting, isn't he? Well, I certainly want to fuck neither of you. The wolf's fist meets, meets Cliff's stomach with a harsh impact. The weasel tumbles into the dirt, yowling as he spins. I'll sit your bed, that woman's shit you're wearing, you gritty pile of shit. The rat advances on the weasel's new location. He lifts his leg, lets it hang in the air for a few seconds, then lets it fall. He kicks three times. Hard. Cliff is then at a horrible noise. I start to wonder if the little guy will get up. Which, unfortunately, means I may have to get into another fight. Claws extend. When all of a sudden the rat stops kicking Cliff. He's sniffling and sobbing on the ground when the clamour dozens of doors opening, people leaving their homes sound throughout the street. I spot William in the distance and he's staring in the direction of the alley. Shit. I'm not paying another fucking fine. Let's get out of here. I've all recognised. I like booze better than I had candy asses. The two quickly run off, leaving the weasel curled on the ground, covered in dirt and bruises, tears streaming from his eyes. He makes pitiful sounds as I crouch over him on my knees. You alright, Professor? It's a student. Can you move? I, 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 I don't n- 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 no. Wiggle your feet. They move fine. Now your hands, now your fingers. Good. You're fine. No, I, I mean, I'm not fine. I was beaten. Everything hurts. But you'll live without any permanent damage. But then I can say most of you have the balls to do what you did back there. He's about to say something else. Furtively, I look left and right to make sure nobody's looking. People are passing us rapidly, but few are paying attention. There must be something important happening in front of us. I bend down and shut him up with a soft kiss. He squeaks in surprise, trembling. His tongue is tiny and receptive and he tastes like mint. Maybe that will help the pain. He stares at me, wipes a tear from his eye and slowly sits up. 
and amused by the sudden lump in his pants. You have the right place. Be smart about it next time. You're supposed to be good at that, right? There's a sudden disturbance at the town centre. Hushed voices and urgent chattering all the way. Don't worry about getting a punch on you from time to time, being what you are here. See, there's always something of these folks to busy themselves with. They can hardly control themselves. They'll forget this in no time. I turned back to put on my best smile for Cliff, but he's already gone. Seems like he's a slippery fella, when he wants to be. Maybe he'll remember that the next time some slob's fist is trying to make intimate contact with his gut. He's a doctor, after all. If he's really a quick learner, then it really shouldn't be a problem, should there? I grow more concerned just pondering it. Meanwhile, the crowd is growing. Most of them are men, some of which I recognise, most of which are strangers. There are, of course, plenty of women peeking out from the windows, pretending to arrange their curtains. Run among the crowd are two familiar figures. One's William. The other is a red fox with a camera slung around his neck. Murdoch. I've seen him work at the general store and do odd photography jobs about the town, but I've never had to speak with him. I don't know what those miners expect you can do, unfortunately. The big coyote sighs. Ah, uh, usual, I suppose. They want me to sniff out a scumbag so we can dangle on the end of rope. And then they can piss themselves drunk. What else? The fox smiles and sadly shakes his head. How cheerful. Well, at least it sounds like they know how to have fun. They might have had justice if only they'd waited. I already know that Avery will tell me that these photos are useless. These boys are out for blood. They're hungry, they're tired, they're overworked, and now one of them is dead. Even if you paint the prettiest picture of some bastard got drunk and nailed himself in the head, that's not going to give them the relief they want. Well, maybe a keener eye than mine can produce some evidence. These pictures aren't going to show them anything interesting. Perhaps we can tell them that Ralph did it. Don't joke like that. Who's joking? The two men notice me. Sam, just the man I wanted to talk to. William scrutinises me with his sharp gaze, like he always does. I can read the familiar twinge of anger on his face when he stares at me, but I can sense a harsh protectiveness there too, similar to Madame. Talk away. Somebody reported a dead miner. My chest tightens. Folks suspects foul play. The fox suddenly speaks up. And unfortunately tampered with the crime scene. My ears poke up. William gives me a look at that. The fox regards me with a kind, thoughtful gaze. His chirpy voice disarms me and I feel a little less scrutinised. They brought the body to the town square, wrapped up in a blanket, and extracted the purported murder weapon. William growls and nods, jerking his head at the canvas in front of the hanging tree. Hmm, put the pickaxe clean from his skull. I had so much damage we can't have the blunt end on the sharp end hit him. Why does that matter? Well, it muddles the narrative, doesn't it? Was he hit in the head or did he hit himself? He didn't have safe equipment or a light. He doesn't need to know that many details, Murdoch. And aye, most pressing is there were signs of a struggle. They won't be now. Idiots. So you might never know what happened. The coyote stares me down. Well, maybe not, but it's possible you could help us. I feel dizzy. Help? How? With your proclivities. Murdoch looks away, appearing not to listen, and busies himself with his camera. He takes a snapshot at a few of the gathered crowds. I understand. I try to look horrified, but it isn't working. I know you've seen plenty of miners. Folks get sloppy when they're... well. William's eyes linger on me, starting from the base of my feet to the peak of my ears. I need to know if Jack had enemies. Personally, I'm willing to bet the fool's looking for gold and wanted to steal away from himself. And he tried to use a pickaxe in the dark. But if something did happen, there's no better evidence than a confession. My stomach is churning. Well, I can try, William. Good man. I'll stop by for further questions later in the evening. Finally, William is walking away. I let out a deep breath. William spent all of five minutes having a conversation with you. He seems to like you. Shit. The fox is still here. What are you blackmailing him with? I choke and I stumble. I don't want to be here anymore. I see Murdoch cock an eyebrow and his smile grows thin. I was just joking. His tail sways slowly behind him as working up a thought. He sniffs the air for a second and his gaze widens. Ha! But his scent is on you, so maybe not. Either way, it's not really my business. I can feel my tail twist up and a little bit of heat rises to my ears. I'm in no mood to be toyed with. What well, ain't your business, exactly? 
The fox flicks his ears to the brothel and makes a jerk-off motion in the air. I was just paying for something I can get for free, that's all. I certainly wasn't expecting an answer like that, but I can't help but laugh. <laughs> Sounds like being a sucker. Uh, not the word choice I'd use for this conversation. Not wrong to some effect. He shrugs. Maybe I'll have some questions of my own tonight when William shows up. Uh, maybe some answers, too. Answers. Yeah, like, I'd have fun around you. Breaks my heart to see a newcomer so gloomy. I'm not looking for fun. I'm looking for prospects. Fun and prospects don't have to be so separate. That sounds like the kind of shit that Jack would have said. If anything, it'd help on the connections end. I've got more than a few. Third generation, born and raised. Sounds suspect. Well, I should hope not. Locals around here have ref reputations to uphold after all. Wouldn't want to be seen as a troublemaker. He grins. Not the kind of reputation I'm after, I'm afraid. Good thing that we're balls at it here, then. Clean-cut grocers and school teachers. No pirates, no bandits, no upstart revolutionaries. A bit pathetic, if you ask me, but it puts bread on the table in an up-and-coming city like Echo. It bode well to have your name established on the map early. I can tell why he's kept his job as a salesman now. Maybe I'll consider your advice. Maybe is all I need. Murdoch takes a bow and makes a hand gesture before turning away on his heels, his big tail swaying from side to side. I certainly had my fair share of people or excitement for the day. If I want to be sane tonight, and more importantly alluring, then I ought to catch a nap. I don't feel so great about William come to visit me tonight. I'm usually always honest with him. Probably why he trusts me. Can't be like that anymore. At least not for a little while. I slide down to the floor, feeling the hard planks dig into my knees. I hear him softly plucking the buttons. His fabric shifts. Whiff it. I lean in to obey. It smells sweaty, musky, very male. No need to build up tension, darling. Suck it. My arms are spread on the bed, hold me stable as I dip down. His tip is already wet. He needs this. I hear him sucking air harshly as my lips part. He's hot and warm in my mouth. My licks are loud and sloppy. He tends to like that. Before long ropes splash my snout, sinking into my fur. That ain't prettier than white on black. He drags his dick across my face, smearing the cum into my snout markings. You're good at this. I wipe a little off my snout that's getting precariously close to my eye. It's not so difficult. Road reject a compliment. You'll do well in my books if you keep pants loose and keep tongues looser. Might even save an innocent man from getting dragged to a murderer can waltz free. I'm a whore, not a spy, William. Any smart whore is a spy. Smart whores live longer, especially if the law is in their favour. Blind eye here and there's what you need more than anything. The coyote starts getting dressed. He stated that more like a fact than a threat, but I can't help feel it's both. I want to tell him the truth, but I can't help but feel that that could be the most stupid thing I could ever do. He does not need to know everything about me. William already has his clothes and shirt back on. Do what you do and be my eyes after dark. Can't keep tabs on, tabs on many folks I'd like with all the new folks moving in. Why don't you do this yourself if you think it's so sight insightful? Because I ain't a cocksucker. I already carved out my way to be of use. You're not so much, fella, but it'll make both of our lives easier. So long as you're sheriff. So long as I'm sheriff. William shakes his shaggy head and grunted, rising from the bed as he pulls on his suspenders. You'll learn about the world quick enough. Quicker will be better on my lad. He sighs. Anyway, clean yourself up before you talk to me outside. I need witnesses to a better reason for my visit tonight. Okay. Peaches. The first thing I do is make my way to the washbowl and start scrubbing. The water is cloudy soon enough with what William left behind. The citrus oil masks enough his smell. I grunt while my length presses against the dresser. William doesn't tend to me finishing before he leaves. The clear stain on my trousers has to be taken care of before I go speak with the sheriff in front of others. At least I won't have to wait to be ready for another customer soon. William waits for me at the bar quietly. He's ordering something, chatting lazily with that fox from before. I take a sweet seat between the two of them, which they must have arranged for intentionally. Let's get down to business, then. Murdoch sniffs the air. You mean you hunt already? William shoots him a look. Not in the least. 
and I'll come to watch make a loan out of a sane man and much worse out of the trash. For our murder exists, he makes sucker out of the best medicine for guilt. Pleasures that distract among people proper society tends to forget. Or at least pretend to forget. Proper bookkeeping covers blind spots. I think I'm starting to understand. Which means you need me to meet you need to meet some of the ladies. That'll give us access to the men. The men I can't access. But they can't say that out here, can they? Yeah, I want the powder room then. Cynthia. The fox hurries our way, ready to lead the way. I'm not here very often. Usually because I choose not to be. It's a bit too periwinkle for me. And nothing humbles you more as a whore than the space guaranteed to give you no interest in prospective clients. The girls chatter on sofas while Cynthia leads me to Madame. William? I just need a few words. Madame places her chin on her wrist as she stares into William's eyes, black and sparkling in the candlelight. Pray that they engross me, my tension span is short, and my patience for god fearing men is shorter. I'll be short then. Your sort usually is. Her gown billows as she rises and she gestures to a doorway across the hall. She gives William a wrist. He takes in. She leads him into the office. I can almost hear their muffled voices till the sudden squeak distracts me. Oh, you're here. Christ almighty. This one has a bit of spunk to him. A bit of what? I can show you what I mean if you're willing to spend the night with me. She winks at the weasel, giving them a shy trace of her best smile. Attempting offer, but if I must be honest, I'm most curious about an experience with Sam here. If I'm stubborn enough to take a beating for that, then I'm stubborn enough to seek a unique opportunity. The insides of the weasel's ears blush. Looks he's given me are a bit passionate. Not too much in a lusty way. I'm afraid he might not understand that this is just a job. Perhaps that kiss was a mistake. But anybody would have needed a kiss after putting up with, well, Echo. Well, I'm booked tonight, unfortunately. This isn't even a lie. Nikolai is my regular today. But it's not unusual for Nick to suddenly cancel. He's not always the most reliable customer, even if he is a good friend. Then I will double your usual price. I want to put that on my book in that my bookings aren't for sale, the highest bidder, but they utterly earnestly are. But Madame had warned me about passionate customers. Obsession can easily lead to heartbreak and violence. I'm not entirely sure yet they want to take this weasel's money. I'll consider if my regular client cancels, which happens often enough, but I can't guarantee an immediate booking without prior arrangements. The weasel visibly wilts. I do understand you are a professional after all, and you have to ensure the health of your livelihood. I will make reservations if I cannot book tonight. So is this the fellow with the cold feet then? I try to figure out who Cynthia is talking about when I turn and jump, forgetting the fox is still here. I'm a little bit unnerved by how quiet he can be. Unfortunately not, my dear. I'm here for business, not for pleasure. But your pleasure is our business, aren't I right, sir? I grunt. Then you should have charged me already. I have a lovely time just taking in the atmosphere. I can bill you by the hour if you're that insistent. Murdoch chuckles. Uh, not so much. I'm trained to think of ways to make money faster than I spend it. Mock concern wells up in Cynthia's tone. So he's after our jobs? I remember a little irritably, they did imply it should pay him as opposed to the way around. Oh, I don't think I'm cut out for such a thing, but in another lifetime, perhaps even if I were, I'd have to be cut from a different cloth, so to speak. My family is willful about how I spend my time and develop my trade. So the shorter story is that you're a coward. He's right, you know, I've heard that stop story before plenty of times. I grow a spine and send someone want me's money to slop on a knob. Cynthia sputters into raucous, chirpy laughter. I think I imagined something. For a split second there seems to be a cold, intense hatred come from the fox that distorts and warps his friendly features. Before I can process what I see, his mischievous smile is there again. There's a jolly spark in his eyes. I can sense nothing but warmth now. I can only express this feeling as the onset of a migraine that stops the moment after it begins. If you want a chance of money that, that bad, I'll spend a night. I mean it when I say I don't intend to pay for sex. But if we want to make, the point of, make this a point of personal pride, well, we're going to have to hold a wager. Five times your hourly rate to whoever has the best time. I'm not interested in the uncertainties. If you book me for the night, you pay. I've got far more money to lose if I'm caught spending the night in the brothel. Now who's the coward? Have a little more faith in your hips, Sam. Five for one is a great deal. She leans in close. 
Our family's wealthy enough to pay too. They wouldn't be hurting for much. And they'd squash in rumours about their own son. <coughs> Several of the girls scream. Cynthia looks at me, smoked wife off her face, as her eyes full of concern. There's a little rumble outside I recognise suddenly as the clamour of gathering voices. I look outside the window. There are protesters arguing with one another. Most of them appear to be minors. Some of them are holding signs. One of those signs has the visage of a young ram on it, but I can't quite tell what the words say during the dark. Another one of those signs has Jack's face on it. I feel something twist in my stomach. My fur bristles. I suddenly feel alone in a room full of loud, frightened people. There's a sudden feeling of hot breath on my neck. Like something wants to bite into my throat. William's booming voice brings me back. Everybody hunger down tonight. I don't want to see a single soul wander out into those streets. Looks like all your prospects will have to stay, Sam. Well, I can't attend to all of them. Then attend to one of them. We're going to have to find somewhere for the rest. And that's where we're going to hold it here. We are going to have to make a decision. Well, in my case, a decision of which we go for first. I'm going to be playing all of these routes in my own time. But I'm just going to be doing uh, two of the routes on the videos so I don't uh, overwhelm myself too much. I know definitely who one of them will be. And I haven't quite decided yet on the uh, other one. So that will be fun to find out. But that is it for the opening of the smoke room. And I hope you enjoyed it. It's uh, turning out to be a really good uh, VN so far. And let's have another look at Cardamon's work here. Oh, I love this picture. So, yeah, so uh, I'll be doing my usual routine that uh, when the team bring out a new public update, if it's one of the routes I'm doing or it's a general one, I'll be getting the video done as soon as possible. And so we might skip things if uh, there are updates for routes I'm not doing. And of course, I won't do anything until it goes public. And people tend to ask me when you're doing the videos. It's always when things are public, I'll do them as soon as I can. But that's really all I have to say because I can just see the audience retention graph dropping as I speak. <laughs> no, seriously, I know you're all here of the actual VNs and uh, one or two people just heard me jabber on at the end. But uh, definitely keep an eye out for the uh, smoke room. We won't be doing the others as a premiere. I just chose to do this as a uh, one-off, see how it works and... Uh, Oh, maybe your comments might be useful to uh, people. But until we enter the smoke room again... Yeah, I think that's how I'm going to open these from now on. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way. <laughs> you can tell this is all improvised, can't you? <clears throat> Take two. Until we enter the smoke room again... Bye for now. <laughs>